Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Haja Ali. I think that um, as a, first of all, as a MPA vasculitis patient, I don't know enough about the other vasculitides and I'm very excited to be learning this kind of information. I've, I've just touched on it a little bit. And I think what would be great right now is if we let you and Chris talk a little bit about her journey and, and you can ask some questions that'll be helpful to all of us about that. Sure. So we, we are really very fortunate to have Chris here. And uh, uh, Chris we would be very uh, uh, helpful for, for our patients and who is listening to really, if you can share some of your journey and, and uh, I know you have a great book there. And, uh, but if you give us a little bit, a, a small, uh, you know, just a few minutes on how was your journey? And, and if you can share that with us, it will be great. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you so much for um, that presentation. Was I learned a lot and I've been working with this or living with this for over 20 years. So uh, a quick summary of um, my journey and I'll, I'll try to keep this concise and you can dig in where you'd like to after. In 1997, I was 26 and I was at work and I was having difficulty, um, just a lot of confusion and um, forgetting things. And I would just literally sit and forget what I was doing and have a difficult time just even getting going again. Um, and that just went on for about a week and I quit my job. And upon quitting my job, shortly after that, I had a lot of different times where I would just be lethargic and depressed. And then I would be back to myself. So it was very up and down, um, back to myself. And then just these mood swings, relapses. I wouldn't say at that point in time, I, I was experiencing any headache, um, but I just had a lot of nausea, lack of appetite. I uh, wasn't myself really low energy and I'm, I'm not a low energy person at all. Um, and I just felt like my whole life was like turned upside down. But at the same time, I wasn't re able to relate to that. If I was in my normal frame of mind, I think I would have realized something was wrong. And I would have talked to my mom and dad or, you know, my anyone, a friend. But I just, I couldn't even cognitively understand something was wrong. A um, couple of weeks later, I went out for a run and I kept falling and scraped my hands. And that was actually a seizure. We didn't know that. Um, and then a couple weeks after that, um, I had a grand mal seizure, went to the ER a couple days later, another grand mal seizure went to the ER. Um, so that this all started in April of 1997. And by June 11th, I was you know, the third time in 10 days in the ER with grand mal seizures. And, um, what's interesting and, and challenging at the same time was these mood swings were at that point in time, then going really um, difficult for my family because there were mood swings. I was catatonic one second, defiant another second, and then having this crazy maniacal laughter, you know, in another minute. And so they, at that point, put me in the neurological unit, which I stayed for two days. Um, and my mom was very frustrated because I had, was clearly having physical signs where I would have a grandma seizure, yet they put me in um, this, this like type of area, a neurological unit. And then finally, on June 13th, they moved me up to neuro neurology, where I was monitored by an EEG. Um, June 16th, I was no longer speaking, so it just went really downhill quickly. Um, I, was, I would be fighting with the staff one minute to get out of bed, and the next minute, completely catatonic. Um, by, the, by, the 20, or by the 17th, I was not talking. I was like whimpering in my, um, just laying there whimpering, and I guess in pain. Uh, and I would just say from basically June 11th on, I have, I have no memory. So this was the time when my mom was encouraged by one of the nurses to write a journal every day of every single like detail, which then became the book. And this is why I can tell you the story because she and I um, talked about it, which took me some time to um, want to deal with, but by, by June 24th, um, they had a neurology recommended a brain biopsy. I had the biopsy um, on the 25th and um, June 28th, my heart stopped for seven seconds while I was in the ICU. And 
my fever went up to like 104 and it was just a, a tumultuous week where a pacemaker was discussed and my temperature got too high. So that never happened. Um, and then as, as tumultuous as that was, as soon as the biopsy came back, they, they were able um, to doctor to see that it was vasculitis, which um, we were told was where it was fortunate and lucky um, that they could see that from the biopsy. So I had the massive doses of prednisone, the high dose prednisone um, right away. And that continued along with methotrexate probably about 20 other things going on at the same time drug wise. Um, but the, those are the, the main things. So the, the prednisone continued and physically I started doing kind of therapy where I'd be walking. Um, so I lost the speech. I couldn't track with anybody, but I could physically start to do this physical therapy walking. Um, but there was really no pattern. I have a good day and then have a bad day where I just lay there and my temperature would spike to 103. Um, and just gradually, gradually, the bad days got less and less and the good days got more and more. Um, I guess I, I should back up and, and say my, doc my doctors did give a diagnosis um, to my mother um, right after the biopsy came back and said that she is, um, she'll no longer be able to, uh, she'll live in a nursing home the rest of her life. She will no longer be able to um, speak. She'll be in a diaper and we won't have any of her physical and mental capacities. And to that, my mom said, you're wrong <laughs> um, because she is who she is. And, and so I'm sorry, I backtracked on that. But after that happened, again, we had the physical therapy constant. And um, I started doing a really a lot better with that by right around, um, you know, July 18th, I was doing physical therapy really well, but the, my mom was just noticing the mental piece wasn't coming back. August 2nd was the first time I recognized my mom and said her name. And then things start to really, I think the prednisone, I, I, mean, I don't know, just, um, I'm a stubborn person. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think things just started to get better and better. The medicine worked and I, um, I went to a day therapy or a senior center and nursing home for about three weeks. Um, there they removed my feeding tube and then I think right about, um, right around September, I was home, but going to, um, occupational therapy and then probably a full two years, um, in the, you know, occupational therapy back and forth. Um, a little bit of, uh, therapy, you know, um, psycho psychological therapy, a little bit to, um, doing flashcards, playing the piano, <laughs> doing anything to try to stimulate my brain. Um, and my first job was probably two years later where I worked in a as a cashier. And that was very hard for me. Very, very hard for me. And very, um, you know, I still, I still feel that feeling I felt where I it was just completely, um, I, I was back to the point where mentally I was ashamed of where I was at in my life. And I think that's, that took probably, you know, good, good amount of time. So I didn't know I was going to go down that route, but I think it's important for people to know that being really sick has a, um, you know, huge, a huge impact on like Dr. Calabrese was talking about in his, uh, his um, presentation, what's overall wellness. And I, I, I was really focused at that point in time in my physical wellness and getting better. And I, um, you know, I just was shutting out the mental wellness. And that was, that was a part that became more important to me, probably 10, 15 years later, um, which I don't know why it took that long, but um, just it just did. And everybody's got their journey, which I completely respect. And um, that's why I want to help so much with the Vasculitis Foundation, because I think that everybody has a different journey. And like you said, it's such a different way that the disease or the illness works is so, so different. So whatever I can do to, to help, I would, you know, really like to. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so sorry of what you've been through. But but I'm so happy that you are with us. Look at your recovery and what you're doing now. And this is just a testimony that this is an illness that can be treated if you have the uh, willingness and, uh, you know, all what you have done on your own and what your family have done to you. So um, it, it took around two months to make a diagnosis from April to June. And, you know, you know, were we hoping, you know, that with awareness of this, uh, that um, 
this actually time and interval be less and less because this is a very critical time where you have inflammation in the brain and uh, you know, they're not on treatment until June. And then the more you are, your brain is inflamed, the more damage will happen. Um, so, you know, when you reflect back uh, on, on your journey, do you think, and when you talk to your, your family, do you think that was the hardest time is getting that diagnosis? Yeah, I, th I think that if you're asking, was that the hardest time that they had to deal with it? Um, I, I think it, it was a, one of their very hard, hard times, but I think what you had mentioned, you have to get through all the wrong diagnosis first, might have been even harder. I think that it was finally just, even though it wasn't good news, it was it was the right news. And it was the, the true news where I'd been, you know, anything from um, encephalitis. I mean, there was a different diagnosis every week. And I think that was even harder to just never have an answer. If, if you were to ask my mom in the end, she would have probably said, well, she finally has the answer. And even though it was terrible, she finally felt like, okay, I, I can, you know, I, I can at least know what it is so I can try to put a plan together. Absolutely. And what you mentioned is very important is actually to treat, to look at every aspect of our recovery is not just taking the medication. Uh, we have, we have uh, seen in our patients and in our research is that a uh, patient reported that there is a very high level of depression and anxiety in our patient and no wonder why. So you really have to, to, we ask our patients how they're feeling mentally, because if, if they're not feeling mentally well, they're not going to be motivated to do anything. They're not going to be motivated to go to therapy or, you know, it's not just a pill, you take it and that's it. So, so having all these measures that you could do, if you have an illness or you don't have an illness, you have to put it together. So, so looking at the patient as a whole, you know, their mental illness, their social illness, their exercise, what they eat, uh, uh, this is all important in, in the recovery of our patients, uh, not just, um, just taking pills in, in, and that's it. So if you um, look back and, and you want to tell the medical community or you want to tell your you know, patients who suffer this, what would you advise them? Honestly, I think just exactly what you said is um, take care of yourself in a very well-rounded way and do everything you can to make your yourself um, happy and healthy and, and be good to yourself because you have to get out and you, there are hard times where I felt like I had to make myself do something I didn't feel like doing, um, you know, was through a, a therapy appointment or um, uh, even, even something simple like doing the piano lessons, you know, I, I heard I did that when I was like eighth, eighth grade. I mean, why am I doing that again at age 27? It just felt, you know, awkward. I'm like, nope. I'm doing this. Um, I, I I think that the the most important thing I would share too is just to acknowledge your mental health, you know, too. And um, I think that that was a, a hard thing for me in being diagnosed in 1997, where um, you know mental health is viewed so the the stigma is so much different today than it is than it was then. I I was frankly you know, didn't want to talk about that. It was, I wasn't a tough, you know, athlete and I've been an athlete all my life. So it just felt really um, just difficult for me to ad address that part of my health. If that happened to somebody today, I, I, I think that's a really important piece to encourage is just the, the therapy and, you know, dealing with that so that you feel well enough to get your exercise, to eat really well, to be motivated to do the, the hard stuff. And, um, that's, that was missing a lot for me. So I would say in a nutshell, just be acknowledged where you're at with your mental health, like rate it. I don't know, like journal and, and write down, you know, how am I doing mental health wise today? Oh, well, sorry about that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you're absolutely right. And I think we, as a medical community, sometimes we focus on the 
uh, just some medical treatment with medications and uh, we fail to, um, to, to look at the patient as a whole. But I also, you know, and, and I, and I, you know, you will be surprised when you ask your patients how they're doing mentally. And then that gives them a, an encouragement to just open up. And I think that's true for any diseases and chronic diseases where they have, you know, they have to deal with on top of their illness. This is not an infection that comes and goes. This is something that, you know, lives with us uh, for some time. And if we, and I tell my patients who are hesitant to, to look at that specifically, I would say, just try to, to help yourself, even temporary, to see how you were doing, to get motivated and get through this. And after you go through this, you may not to be on antidepressant. You can have lifestyle changes, et cetera. But this period is really important in, in how we uh, get through. Uh, another important aspect is in addition to the mental health and the physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, is what we call, and I tell my patients, is doing brain gym. So brain gym is, you know, if you have a, a, a weak part of your body, if you have an injury, you really exercise it and you have to exercise your brain. Whether you do, uh, you, you did the piano lessons, which is, was part of the brain gym because you are uh, starting in new connections in your brain. And it's amazing uh, what this does to our brain and it's underestimated. Um, so puzzles or, you know, other things on, on internet based or iPad based or on your phone uh, digitally or just on paper kind of a brain activities uh, that is really important for the recovery of our patients. And I have had patients who really did very well after that. And think about it as, as I said, uh, therapy of your brain. Same thing as if you have injury of your of your tendon somewhere else, you exercise it, you're gonna exercise your brain as well. No, I totally agree. And that might have been something that um, was helpful for me in that I as an athlete, everything that I did to train my body for um, as a gymnast, you know, rep repetitive, I did a lot of conditioning and I would take that. And I would schedule myself for the piano lesson. I also took, um, I went back and had foreign language lessons, French lessons with my high school French teacher. She volunteered to do that with me. So I had my day, even if I, even though I wasn't working like those two years where I was in therapy, I had it mapped out. Um, and my mom helped me with that because she's kind of a, <laughs> she's, she's a hardworking lady. So, um, but I mean that, that I took that approach in my physical life to like, expand it to my mental capacity or to my brain, like the brain gym. But I, I just should have included a little bit of like, okay, you know, talk, talking to myself in a kind way rather than, um, you know, I think I, I think I could have done better at instead of looking at the glass, like, here's what I didn't get done. I, I would maybe, so I think that would be a really important thing for people is just to recap on what you all did, what you all accomplished. Cause we don't, I mean, I don't think anybody really does that, right? We're always kind of looking at what, where you fell short and in illness, it's really important to, at the end of the day, look at those wins and give yourself credit for that. Cause that gives you strength too, to, I think, keep going. I think what you have done with your recovery by actually uh, addressing every aspect of therapy physical as well as, uh, you know, mental and, uh, you know, you did the piano lesson, you did the French lessons where you are uh, uh, starting new connection in your brains, uh, which really has, has helped you. And I think your perseverance in, in doing that systemically and not giving up with the support of the family, uh, this is this is really important. So having a patient with you know with a diagnosis of CNS vasculitis is not just you know on on the patient; it's on the whole family as well. So you really have to have resources. Um, 
and it's true for any vasculitis or system or any other chronic condition, but especially with patients with CNS vasculitis, because at one point, you know, you need physical help, you need mental help, you need, you know, so much to do. It's not just one thing uh, at the time, but uh, we, we are very happy to see this, this, uh, this great recovery in uh, having you as a patient uh, advocate in uh, learning from, from your journey. And thank you very much for sharing that with us.